Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining our finale, the WCET Adaptive Chat finale. Today we have uh, Brian Fleming with Titan Partners joining us to discuss their latest publication, Learning to Adapt 2.0. So, Brian, I uh, would like to just welcome you, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. And to all of the audience that may follow us, uh, you should see an area on your screen where you can post questions. If you run into problems, you can post questions to Megan on Twitter using the hashtag WCT Adaptive, and Megan will help us get your questions posted for Brian. So, Brian, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So, Brian, let's uh, let's just start by doing a basic overview of what effort, what work did it take for Titan to do and bring all this research together? So, could you just give us a general overview of that work and an overview of just the the paper Learning to Adapt 2.0? Yes, absolutely. And again, it's it's great to be able to share this research. Um, it's work that Titan Partners has actually been involved in uh, for a little over five years now, um, largely um, out of our ongoing work and support for the post-secondary success team um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, which if you're familiar with the foundation, you will know um, has a deep commitment to understanding both supply and demand side dynamics around um, tools and technologies and approaches that can be used to scale learning and to drive um, improved learning outcomes and so forth. And so um, along these lines, one area of focus, a priority of area of focus where we support the foundation um, is in a space broadly referred to as digital courseware or digital learning tools of which adaptive learning is one. Um, and so this work really stems out of kind of a, of a broader perspective um, that work that we've done, um, and then specifically through a couple of discrete grant opportunities that the foundation um, has carried out over the years with certain groups of suppliers and even some institutions. Um, we initially commenced this study, this kind of in-depth study of adaptive learning, uh, four years ago, now five years ago, and that's sort of where we get the 2.0 piece, um, is that we published Learning to Adapt um, in 2013, um, when at the time we were actually called Education Growth Advisors um, and have since become Titan Partners, but uh, same, same firm. Um, and what we did at that time was, and it was really, a, I wasn't with the firm at the time, but it was a very novel um, look at this space called adaptive learning, which at the time, I think most people that were conversant with these issues largely knew as something that Arizona State was doing with Newton, and <laughs> no one really knew much more beyond that. Um, you know, certainly familiar with personalized learning and competency-based approaches and so forth, but um, the market really had not fully, at least at that time, kind of understood what this was and what it meant and, um, you know, sort of the breadth of suppliers that are out there from, you know, from um, companies like Newton to Smart Sparrow to some more sort of institutional-led efforts and so forth. So um, over time... Um, we sort of continued to track with that work um, and then um, decided uh, through some of the work that we had done that uh, this year we would actually refresh that work and kind of look at the 2.0 market evolution of adaptive learning. Um, and the results of that, um, that endeavor are published in this, uh, in this report, uh, Nikki, which you had references, which we're calling um, Learning to Adapt 2.0. If that answers your question, happy to spell in more details if needed. No, absolutely, that's fantastic. So, you know, you guys make uh, you 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 have pointed to five emergent themes um, in your paper, uh, particularly for those who are maybe pulling the paper up now, taking a look at it. Um, it would be the summary on page four. So here, you guys list out five emergent themes uh, facing adaptive learning today, and how much um, change. Um, that they've had. So can we just sort of go through those one by one and discuss what, what you guys found in your research? Sure, yeah. So again, in order to do this type of work, um, you know, as you know, you need that sort of longitudinal or sort of long view 
um, of the evolutions in the market, which we believe we're very uniquely poised to, to do, having done the work in 2012. Um, and so what we actually have done through this work, and keep in mind that um, you know, this is the result of, of really actively tracking and following this market over the course of this time. And so what this was not, as I've seen these types of reports, where it's like a dip into the market at one point, a dip into the market another time, without really building the kind of scaffolding across that time. That's actually uh, not what, what happened here, actually, what we've been doing um, both in our work with the foundation, in addition to our work with institutions of higher ed that, that are adapting these, these technologies, um, is to really kind of pull all that together um, and to really sort of take a step back, right, and ask ourselves, okay, so in the last five years or so, what's changed? Um, what has changed a little bit? What has changed a lot? Um, and uh, so that is sort of what we've attempted to present here. Uh, this most recent study, though, and what really enabled us to, to make some of these determinations um, were, you know, qualitative interviews with 20-plus institutions, um, leaders of these institutions that are heavily involved in their adaptive learning efforts. Um, this also included some institutions that were just sort of getting their feet wet and getting started, and so sort of pulling the notes and the results of those interviews together, thinking about trends and, and common themes and so forth that have emerged, um, as well as a survey that we uh, launched among 35 suppliers, um, asking some very targeted questions about their products and, and how they've worked and sort of their general approach. Um, now with that, um, again, we, we sort of, you know, took, to take a step back and to just ask ourselves, well, what do we think has, has happened in the space? Um, and so that's what you'll see here presented, um, and, you know, as you had said on page four of the report. Um, I will just sort of give a quick highlight of, of what we're basically stating here. Um, the bottom line, and not to be too reductionist about this, because believe me when I tell you, and anyone who's engaged with this knows, this is a very complex space. Um, it's very hard, on the one hand, to get people to just agree on what adaptive learning actually means. Mm -hmm. um, you also have to really help people think through the distinctions between adaptive learning um, as a product, as a, as a piece of software that you purchase and use, um, versus an instructional technique and a method and, and, and so forth. And so, you know, we, you really have to kind of disentangle that. Um, once you do, I think, you find that, one, it's a very complex space. Um, but one, I think some of these themes become very clear. Um, the short of which is that what we've observed is that there has actually been quite a bit of movement on the part of adaptive suppliers, so technology companies that develop and sell this software, um, where the challenge and sort of the surprise, surprise, slow movement has been has largely been on the institutional front. Um, institutions still tr struggle to know where and how and in what ways to apply this, these tools, um, how to make sense of the, what is in their minds often a very complex vendor landscape, lots of providers all offering solutions, um, many of which, at least in the minds of, of institutional buyers, are kind of hard to distinguish and kind of sort out how one differs from the other. Um, and so what we, we've certainly gathered is that there really has been little change in terms of institutions' experience um, with adopting these tools and so forth, um, but quite a bit of change in terms of how suppliers have responded. And what we've highlighted here, and this is actually called out as number five, is that adaptive products are building new feature sets in response to institutional demand. And so what we've seen um, is that, and this happens in a couple of ways which the piece highlights or the paper highlights, um, ways in which the vendors have actually really kind of sought to uh, to adjust their own approaches and, and practices and products to accommodate what institutions are asking for. Um, but then at the same time, um, you know, certainly while we found institutions have more experience with these tools, um, their sort of path to a broader implementation, particularly an implementation at scale, is still quite unclear. unclear. Then, as with anything, there's kind of a murky middle. Um, things that we think have changed um, probably haven't changed a whole lot, uh, but have certainly changed more than others. Um, where, for example, we have seen a few more kind of discrete applications of this technology, um, ways in which the technology has actually been used in kind of very deliberate ways, and we highlight that through a couple of case studies. Mm -hmm. um, the role of faculty changing, uh, which is the piece that I'm actually most excited um, as we sort of uncovered what we, we came to really describe as adaptive teaching, and I'm certainly happy to spell out more of what that means, but I think you know, really cool stuff, exciting to see institutions and faculty 
um, kind of really getting a hold of, of all that this technology can do. Um, we certainly see um, some momentum and some change on that front. Um, and then quite a bit of attention to um, adaptive learning in reference to competency-based learning, which, you know, if you're familiar with this space, you'll know they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that while competency-based learning is not adaptive learning, necessarily, uh, adaptive learning really is a form of competency-based learning, or it's at least an approach or a vehicle to more competency-based methods. And so there, again, we see, uh, see quite a bit of traction, um, but in a couple of discrete ways, um, which the, the paper also highlights. Yeah, so what do you think, or what have you seen um, in terms of how the faculty role is changing? Because I, I know in working with our university, it definitely does change the role mm -hmm. of the faculty, um, and really a whole group of people. But what, what have you, you guys seen through your research? Well, it's a great question, um, and it's one that um, I think you always want to take a step back and say faculty is a very generic term, right? And so mm -hmm. it depends on the institution, the institution type, the discipline. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of variables that go into that. Um, in fact, we were just at a gathering in D.C. Uh, last week um, among um, a group of adaptive uh, suppliers and institutions, and it was very fascinating to hear um, just <laughs> the various ways in which a faculty member might use this, and it's very discipline-specific and so forth. But, you know, generally speaking, what we have seen um, is a much more deliberate and, I think, holistic use of this technology Mm -hmm. at least among faculty, and this is where we get this kind of notion of, of adaptive teaching, right, where the use of the technology um, actually enables, excuse me, that's my, my colleague there just grabbing his water. <laughs> We're kind of an open office here, so apologies. Um, where uh, the use of technology is actually used not just to facilitate active learning, but active teaching. Um, this is, this is, I think, a very important distinction to draw, and this came through in a couple of our interviews. Um, you know, we often think of the use of instructional technology from a student perspective, which is obviously important, uh, but also to think of this through a faculty perspective, right? What does this technology actually enable, enable me as a faculty member to do? Um, and so this is where we have seen quite a bit of momentum uh, insofar as the technology, on the one hand, makes instruction more active, and I'm just sort of kind of going through what we have highlighted on page 10, um, insofar as the faculty member actually has more control or more transparency into the progression of learning throughout a course from start to finish, and that can be gathered through analytics and um, being able to do some really sophisticated competency mapping and really thinking about students' journey throughout a course. Um, I mean, again, that's, a, that's at least to those faculty members that are um, conversant and desiring that type of experience. Um, the technology really does enable, I think, what is a very new and uh, kind of exciting way of thinking about how you would take students to a course. Um, the, fact, the technology also, uh, believe it or not, makes the experience, at least from the faculty members that we spoke with, far more relational. Um, as, as, as faculty members really are able to be more of a guide on the side um, kind of a mentor for students, allowing the technology to pick up um, in areas where either the content itself is fairly recursive and doesn't need a whole lot of kind of explanation but can be picked up um, um, by a student kind of going through on their own pace, um, but allowing the faculty member to actually step back, observe student learning in a holistic manner, and then kind of stage interventions and conversations here and there um, as needed. Um, on this level, faculty members become much more involved, um, at least from what those that we heard that, you know, as they were teaching with this technology and really kind of seeing it over time, um, found that uh, they felt their role was actually more involved. They knew their students a lot more. They had much more awareness um, into how their students learned and how they were progressing. Um, and then finally, and we sort of refer to this in the paper as insightful at scale, um, which is a kind of a loaded statement, but allows what I just described to happen at scale, meaning among a bunch more students, um, and in a way that is actually, and, and I know this term is a little controversial, but is actually pretty efficient on some level, and then I can actually be incredibly insightful. Uh, I can stage very productive interventions with students. I can help students along the way, especially students that are in need. 
um, among you know, obviously a much broader, larger uh, population. And so, um, you know, again, just thinking about the evolving nature of the faculty role, those are a few things that uh, that we've observed. Any chance, any chance that you discussed or worked with any faculty using this in really large classrooms, like with hundred plus students in a course? Yes, well that's actually, I mean, because you know, as you know, I mean, that's really the goal in many respects. Um, you know, and I would say myself, having been a faculty member for a number of years before getting into the work I'm doing, um, you know, if you have a class of 10 people, um, you know, forgive me for saying, but th this technology may actually not be necessary, or it might be for certain, you know, certain applications, and I think there are very interesting ways of using um, adaptive learning even among small groups, but by and large, really what you're looking at is are environments where there are impediments to scale, where student success is stifled by, um, you know, a lack of attention from, from faculty or just sort of the sheer size of the course or the pacing of the course, which can be very prohibitive, uh, particularly for uh, folks that are not able to learn in kind of your sort of conventional, in your conventional ways, right? Going to class, sitting there, going, doing homework, coming back, whether they have a job or, or kids or whatever is going on in their life. Um, this technology obviously enables a more personalized pathway, um, which is, is obviously very beneficial. Um, so all of that to say, um, yes, within larger courses is where you see this technology most commonly adapt adopted. Um, and, you know, as you think about how it is used in that way, um, you're going to see a diversity, and if I'm getting your question, sorry, but, I, you know, you're going to see a diversity of applications. Um, you know, in terms of a full-blown enterprise-wide adoption uh, of an adaptive learning solution across an entire, let's say, a general ed curriculum, uh, you're not going to see that necessarily yet. Um, lo and behold, there will always be a couple that will sort of pop off and you go, oh, wow, that's interesting. I didn't realize that institution was doing it in quite that way. But you really haven't seen the space mature quite to that level. Uh, what you do see, though, are uh, uses of these tools, whether as kind of remediation or homework assistance tools. Uh, to what would be considered kind of more enterprise adoptions where um, the adaptive solution actually functions actually as, as courseware, where it really does span the entirety of the course. Um, students are interacting with the software on a much more consistent basis. Assessments are part of the mix. Um, analytics are produced. Faculty members are then kind of thinking about um, how students are progressing. Um, that, that is a very common scenario particularly in some of these, these larger courses. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind of a quick reaction to, to that particular application. Let, let's shift over just a little bit, and um, I've got a question here that's been posted. Let's talk a little bit about the company. So uh, referring, referencing page 18 of the document, um, you talk about the complexity of the vendor space, including the differences of using products or a whole course versus a supplemental. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, which approach is getting more buy-in um, from faculty and from administrators? Sure. Um, well, it's it's a good question. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's it's one that anyone can really answer in a real definitive way. Uh, what seems to be the case, um, that said, is that. Um, the technology itself is often built for whole course applications. Um, from the faculty perspective, I think that you still see a desire to sort of experiment with the technology in very discreet and measured ways, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps not through a full-blown adoption of the technology, um, but by sort of test driving and piloting the technology in various ways, uh, but in ways that I think are probably still more complementary to an existing teaching practice then they would be, you know, when they, then they would sort of mark a substantive change. And so I think what's interesting is that on the supplier front, the technology is actually set up and capable of delivering that kind of whole course experience. Uh, that said, is the demand there for that particular type of experience? I think there's still quite a bit of friction um, among faculty members, at least those that we've looked at. Um, in terms of how. And I think where the issue comes down, though, and I think this is where increased transparency and flexibility on the part of suppliers is very important, is that, you know, for a lot of faculty members, and again, I'm being very general here, but again, this is just kind of some findings from the research, um, it's not necessarily a wholesale, and we've talked about this quite a bit even on other conversations like this, it's not that there's this wholesale rejection of technology, 
a lot of times it's just a lack of awareness as to what it does and, and how it works. And so we've even done some publishing around um, you know, breaking the black box of adaptive learning, meaning making the way this, these tools and technologies actually work and how they're used much more transparent to faculty. I think that's an area where you are seeing quite a bit of traction both on the demand and the supply uh, front, which I think is very interesting. Um, in terms of what you see here, though, mm -hmm. uh, by and large, most tools are whole course solutions, meaning they really are kind of an end-to-end -end, uh, courseware solution with, um, you know, with content, with kind of rich interactivity features, um, assessments, analytics, and so forth. Um, that, is, that is a very common scenario. I think another interesting point, and this is where I might highlight a solution like Smart Sparrow or, or Fish Tree is that you have a high degree of autonomy, though, in terms of how someone actually uses that tool. And so this is where we get into this kind of distinction between what is really an off-the-shelf type of solution. I take it, I flip the switch, it goes, and then I sort of stage interventions and work with students as they go to something where the faculty member is actually much more hands-on and, and they actually create uh, the course experience themselves. It's obviously more manual. Um, but um, but I think has been an area where we've seen quite a bit of attention. And I think that sort of is this marriage, if you will, between you know faculty members wanting a high degree of autonomy, or at least the ability to sort of control and manage um, the flow of, of, the, of the course or the use of the software, while at the same time uh, providing a solution that really is kind of all-encompassing and holistic. I think that the market is, it would appear, kind of starting to come together around that need, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest barriers, right? Like, it takes a lot of work to build out a, a customized course, and yep. do you think professors, will, we, this would move and gain a little more traction if there were cut courses made that could be customized? Because, you know, in, in all the different um, platforms, you know, there's got to be training on how to utilize an author in those platforms, and if you're yeah. not really tech savvy or understand authoring, you know that could really be a barrier, you know, to moving forward. So, have you seen, or has there been any conversations in the research that you guys did? Did anybody complain about that? Like, I'd love to have something that had everything in it, and I could just rip out what I do not want. What do you What do you see, Brian? Well, I think, you know, it's typical consumer behavior, right? We have a bunch of sort of very um, distinct expectations, yet we sort of want a product to do it all, right? And so that, that's always a challenge, right, is that I, you know, I might want a high degree of autonomy or control over my use of the product. At the same time, I want the product to be comprehensive. I want it to be, you know, of a certain measure of quality. I want it. So, you know, there's sort of these frictions that I think uh, folks really do have to work out. And so I think, you know, when you talk with faculty members, the expectation is often that they will have a high degree of autonomy over how the product is used, what content is incorporated, um, you know, how these kind of so-called algorithms work. And, and that sometimes is a bit of a question. Um, at the same time, there is sort of an expectation that the product will adapt, if you will, based on my sort of needs and expectations. And so what one thing that I think has come up before um, is that, you know, the, at the start, I may say, I'm sort of faculty member X, uh, that I need a high degree of autonomy over how this, 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 this product is used. I want it to be very customizable. I need to control this. I need to create this myself. And then once they gain some exposure into the way these products work, they actually see the content itself is actually quite good. It's really engaging, it's crisp, it's clear, it's well produced. Um, okay, so I may take this and that and I may sort of piece this together. And before you know it, they may end up actually using what is for all intents and purposes an off-the-shelf type of experience, right? But they actually were involved in the creation and the crafting um, of that. Um, at the same time, you know, you do also have to think about, so I should say along those lines, and this is an area, and we're actually about to launch a, a survey, um, a, nat a nationwide survey among faculty and administrators here in the next couple of days, actually, um, where we're going to be thinking about barriers to adoption of courseware. Um, one of the barriers that we often see, though, and this kind of gets back to my previous comment about consumer behavior, is there's also this concern around the time it takes for faculty to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so. What does the market want? <laughs> it's a common question, right? Do you want something that's off the shelf? Maybe, maybe not. Do you want something that's customizable? Yes, no. 
Um, and so where I think this is really starting to come together is in what we've seen um, is in the use of products that are, you know, um, in many respects, kind of easy to use, that they're customizable not just in terms of how faculty actually set up courses, but how faculty actually interact with kind of the whole suite of offerings that the product offers. Um, um, would you say, Brian, almost like offering learning objects and allowing them to go in and pick and choose which ones and choose a, from a list of interaction types? You know, do you, yeah. think we, do you think if we get to that point that we could get better faculty and institution buy-in? I, so, I mean, I think the issue, and I think that's a good point to call out learning objects, I think what it is is that you create a platform that is itself an experience for a faculty member to use, right? It, it, it allows me the ability to, to pick and choose and to customize and to really think about the crafting of a student experience or a learning experience within a course. But then the platform and using the platform in and of itself is actually an experience that's well orchestrated. Um, the product is easy to use. It's engaging. Um, it provides me with options, right? So again, I might say I want something that's very customizable. I may want something that's off the shelf. Chances are I'm going to want a little bit of both, right? And so I think that's where the onus is really on the suppliers. Then, you know, to get back to the research, we have seen quite a bit of momentum among technology suppliers in creating these solutions that almost kind of check all of those boxes. Mm -hmm. I think that if the market can figure that out, um, certainly, I think you will certainly see more adoption and kind of a broader openness to this. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that said, um, I, I, I don't know. You know. There could be other issues. Um, I think there are still certainly a lot of discussion, I think, in recent times, in recent days even, around issues of academic freedom and you know, how these technologies are actually used, what's mandated, what's optional, um, how students interact with this technology. Um, you know, there's issues around all the implicit biases within the way these algorithms work. That's kind of an emerging conversation that could come up. Um, but I would say, by and large, when the products become easier to use and they actually create a more engaging experience uh, for faculty members and for students, it would be hard to imagine adoption not, uh, not increasing. I think you hit a key point. I think, you know, while I'm a student-centered person myself, I do think that in terms of becoming student-centered, we've got to also consider the faculty's experience. And, and so maybe that's probably a big gap that the the industry is missing. So, you know, let's say we, let's in a utopia, you know, we get there, we, we make this super easy for faculty, very customizable. They can take somebody's learning object and cost, customize it in any way they want to. Do you think, do you see an enterprise, do you see this becoming where it is like the computer is? You know, when it first came out, it was like, oh, nobody can ever afford those things. You know, do you think that we ever get to the point where it's just one of the solid, dependable technologies that help us with education? You know, there's not, there's no one technology. We all know that it's an ecosystem, but do yeah. you think it ever becomes a real consistent member of that ecosystem? Well, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's possible. I mean, if you think about the learning management system, or what really is the content management system. Um, you know, that at, at one point was really kind of a bleeding edge type of, of product, right? Um, institutions might have used them for very kind of discrete um, uh, responsibilities or needs or issues, but it certainly was not really an enterprise-wide tool um, or one that was used very broadly or for teaching and learning purposes. Um, that has certainly changed. I think the LMS has become mainstream. It has been for quite some time. Um, I think that there are probably some questions around why that is the case and whether things like adaptive software will follow that same track. Um, and to me, it would be questionable to say that all of this is just moving in the same direction. Um, the learning management system probably poses far less barriers to how instruction is actually delivered. Um, you know, to, to evoke a, a familiar term, it's a little bit less disruptive. Um, I think adaptive technology itself is actually a fairly disruptive force. It really it changes the way teaching and learning happens. It uh, changes the way content is delivered. Um, it actually starts to change content itself. Um, you know, it does always make the question around the use of textbooks. Textbooks, paper textbooks have always had that issue. 
Um, and faculty members have been able to sort of pick and choose and decide what they were going to teach and what they were not going to teach. Um, there are some arguments that adaptive uh, software is a bit different than that, and it's a much more pervasive type of practice. Um, but, you know, that said, I think that, you know, I probably would think of that question, Nikki, far probably in more kind of a broader social cultural type of perspective. I think that we're all moving towards um, an age where technology is becoming far more commonplace. Um, both in our daily lives and in the way that we learn. Um, and I think that as these technologies become more user-friendly, um, as, as suppliers so figure out more creative ways to, to cut costs and to make this more accessible, um, I think that that will certainly, again, we'll see an increase in adoption. I would also not, you also have to take into account um, uh, open source aspects of this as well. So there are a number of these technologies out there that actually are free to use. Um, they are open source. Uh, they've been around in some respects for quite a while. Um, that's another interesting conversation. Um, I think the issue there is, generally speaking, is issues of quality and whether those technologies themselves actually um, are as well integrated and well developed. Um, and that's sort of, again, it's a much broader conversation. Uh, but I think there you'll see probably much more um, activity as well. Yeah, I like to refer to adaptive learning and competency-based as cousins. You know, they're so similar, but they're not the same. And sure. you know, adaptive learning lends itself very nicely to programs that want to focus on competencies, which we essentially all do that. We just call them learning objectives. Sometimes, sure. I don't know, it's just semantics, I guess. But, you know, I often think that um, the adaptive learning piece, and, and, and you hear this in a lot of discussions, you know, it really can fundamentally change the entire structure of high yes. school, you know, yes. and is that good, you know, how does that impact faculty, how does that impact, financially impact the university, do students still pay the same amount, I just think it opens, there are lots of things that institutions are going to have to consider in terms of the way they are built, so to speak. Yeah, well, it gets to the issue of, you know, at the heartbeat of the edu of education period, the entire enterprise, um, is curricula. Right? What is taught, why it's taught, how it's taught. Um, those are fundamental questions. That's the be all of education, right? And so when you start to think about the introduction of new methods and techniques and technologies, um, at least I often like to think about it um, actually both from the perspective of being a consultant to this industry as well as being a parent and really sort of thinking about how my own three and a half year old learns. You know, you start to think about things like why is this taught this way, right? How is this being taught? Uh, for what purpose is this actually being taught? Um, and when you start to really think about it within that framework, um, I think that some of these things, I think competency-based, again, is another example of this. It's an incredibly disruptive force of the industry because it really does rethink a lot of those assumptions and those conventions. Uh, and I agree. I think adaptive competency, I mean, they're sort of cousins um, close cousins, um, and I think that that's, you know, and I think, again, yeah, those two uh, certainly do uh, come together in many ways as well. Yeah, I think between the two of them, I really think they're going to impact and, and make a lot of waves in higher ed, and I don't know if they're going to do it or not, you know, that's what, it's hard, I don't know enough about the financial side of higher education, but I think it'll be good for students, I think it'll be good for learners. Yeah, well, I think that it will, well, so, yeah, I mean, I think to your point, I appreciate, you know, what you said in terms of, you know, I'm a student-centered person. I mean, I think that we all should be in many respects, right? I mean, that's what we're here for. Um, I think that, you know, when you start to look at some of these methods, I think one of the things, this is kind of an anecdote, but um, a couple of years ago, um, I was in a prior role, and I was doing a lot of work in competency-based education, um, and I actually spoke with all six regional accrediting bodies and just asked them a couple of really targeted questions around competency-based and what their awareness of it was and um, you know, what their thoughts are in terms of the long-term progression of that model. And, and it really stuck out to me was that um, one head of, a, of one of the regional accrediting bodies actually said to me that this person had a problem with the term competency-based. I said, okay, what do you mean by that? And, and she said that it shouldn't all education be competency-based? <laughs> so if you're talking about the presence of learning objectives and outcomes, shouldn't all good education have 
a high degree of awareness and presence to learning outcomes and objectives. So, you know, from their perspective, they were sort of scratching their head, thinking, well, what is that? what's new? What are we talking about? Really what you're talking about is curricular innovation or better ways of doing what we've always been doing. Um, you know, I'm not saying I really listen to it, but I think that was an interesting point um, that I think really does speak to some of the student-centeredness that you were talking about um, and in the way in which um, some of these kind of so-called new instructional models themselves may actually not be that new. Yeah, so you know, you, when you th when you start talking about all of that, you, you maybe think of the gaming. I see a big avenue for more gaming interactions um, mm -hmm. with adaptive learning, and yes. uh, I just I just see the struggle though. I see the struggle with things like simulations and and some of these just due to the graphics and and how do people get their hands on that? Is that something that there will eventually be a repository for that people can purchase? You know. That tends yeah. to be, you know, in my own instructional design projects, I think the hardest part for me is getting the images that I need to create the interaction or the experience that I'm trying to create for users, you know. Uh, so um, overall, you know, where do you, where do you think this is going to go? Is this going to become the LMS that's sort of, you know, come, become like the LMS where it's just, doesn't really have an impact, but it's there, and everyone kind of has access to it. Or, you know, will this does this really have a chance? Does adaptive and competency based really have a chance of getting a strong foothold in higher ed and yeah. making an impact? You know, what do you think? Well, I think so that evokes the kind of long-standing discussion about the post LMS, post post LMS, future of the LMS. What is the LMS? Um, and to that, there are folks that are far more conversant with those issues. Um, you know, I might think about someone like Tom Cavanaugh or Tom Jutson, um, folks that have really led the conversation around, you know, how do these technologies, um, how are they evolving and how are they progressing? Um, and I think even to what you're saying, um, you know, the role of social learning, gamification, adaptive learning, I mean, there are all kinds of, of, of new opportunities or new ways of thinking about the intersection of technology and all of these things. Um, you know, so that conversation and that evolution will certainly continue. There, there's no question about that. Um, you know, I think maybe to your previous question, you know, does something like an adaptive platform come to replace the LMS? Um, I, I'm not sure that question can even be answered because I think in a lot of respects it becomes more of an issue of integration and enablement. So, you know, does the LMS become a platform that integrates various tools through LTI and, and interoper interoperability features. Uh, that seems very likely to where, you know, essentially it becomes the kitchen sink or kind of the big connecting platform and tool. And I think a number of the major providers are already kind of heading in this direction anyway by opening up the platform through APIs and allowing apps and, and new technologies to be integrated within that. Um, that is, to be clear, for those that are sort of new to the space, that's how a lot of these adaptive platforms work. Um, it would actually be integrated directly into the learning management system. And from the student perspective, they probably would not know that they were using Smart Sparrow or SnapWiz or something like that. Um, so I think, you know, that certainly is already happening and I think will certainly continue. Um, you know, will this stuff become some sort of enterprise wide learning tool that uh, becomes mainstream and, and, and conventional to your previous comment? Um, I'm not sure. That's 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 a that's a good question. I think that we're all we will all sort of wait and see. It would certainly seem, at least when you look at what's happening on the supplier front, that there's a tremendous amount of innovation um, and and product um, you know product modifications and adjustments. When you start thinking about the product roadmap for a lot of these solutions, it's incredibly impressive what they are doing and what they can do. I think the question just becomes whether demand is there. Um, and that, that, I think, sort of is, is yet to be determined. So if K-12 are participating, you know, iStation, iReady, all kinds of different um, adaptive programs through math and, and, and um, English, you know, if we, if there's a big change, you know, Barack Obama has a big push going on to really increase uh, the speed of high speed internet, the quality of the internet, and you know, 99% of the schools having that within the next four years or five years, I believe. So, you yeah. know, 
thinking about that student that's coming to us, you know, how does that change? You know, how does that impact us when we get a student who's been accustomed, say three or four years down the road, you know, lots yeah. of students are playing with one-to-one -one devices. You know, students are expecting that. So what do you think the student is going to expect in four to five years when they come in yeah. to come on our campuses? What do they expect? Well, I think what you're describing, absolutely. Um, I think this gets into the question of, you know, the digital native, and I think now we're saying the post-digital native, or, you know, I mean, there's just so many terms, but I think that generally, um, yes, I mean, I think the use of digital technologies that provide a kind of end-to-end -end comprehensive experience, uh, ones that can be used for fun and for gaming, but also for very functional purposes, um, including education, um, I mean, that, that error is not coming, it is here. It is very much here. Um, and I think it, it, it's incumbent upon higher ed to, to catch up to that. Um, I think what we need to probably parse out there is that the distinction between different student populations. And so, you know, on the one hand, if we're talking about online education, kind of conventional online programs, um, you're largely talking about an adult learner population, which is going to have a different set of needs and expectations. Um, compared to an 18-year-old, you know, coming out of a, of a district that has adopted a lot of technology and is very familiar with the use of, of mobile apps and technology in the classroom, going to a college. I think that you're looking at really two sets of consumer preferences there. Um, on both fronts, I think the expectation, and there's certainly plenty of data to support this, um, I've been involved in, in some of these, these market research efforts in my career, um, is, you know, the expectation is that the technology will be present. Uh, that it will be easy to use, that it'll be impactful, and that it will allow me to achieve the things that I have entered this experience to achieve, right? Um, so the technology will enable me to pass Chemistry 101. Um, it will provide a tool, it will provide a framework, it will provide content. Um, it, it, is a, it is a means to an end in that respect. I think that, you know, for the adult learner, the technology is enabled or to access uh, breaking down barriers that would be to potentially in place uh, based on campus location and so forth. So I think in that respect, uh, that's obviously very much expected and very much mainstream in many respects. Um, you know, does this eventually evolve into some sort of um, way in which technology is really pervasive across the whole of the learning experience, um, regardless of, of where someone comes from? Um, it would not seem to me that most institutions are set up for that uh, just yet or anytime soon. Um, and I think that those types of that sort of vision, whatever that vision is, is probably still quite a ways off. Um, but certainly, I think that the more, we will certainly see more technology in the mix for sure. Now, I think there's also, you know, another piece, and this gets into the whole research that you know, has been done around you know, millennials and digital natives and preferences and needs. It's not really a desire for technology for technology's sake, right? Um, there's been plenty of research to suggest it. It's not as if I want to sit here and hold an iPad and learn. It's that this iPad can produce a very impactful, very engaging learning experience mm -hmm. for me that can enable me to do something else, whatever that might be, get my degree, get a good job, whatever the case may be. I think in that respect, it's incumbent on all of us, uh, particularly, um, you know, I think actually I'm just hearkening back to this conversation I was in in DC last week where um, there was one CEO of a technology company in the room, very thoughtful, very engaged. And he, he said that, you know, our goal is really for our technology to get out of the way and for learners to learn and teachers to teach. Yeah. Um, I thought that was a really cool image, right? It's, it's not, we're not all after technology and more of it. We're after better teaching and learning and the technology is an enabler to that. Yeah, I'm not sure that answers your question, but it, it certainly gets at a few of the, I think, the comments that, that you had raised. So from a faculty perspective, you know, the technology as faculty builds skills and knowledge and, and how to implement that and use it, you know, it allows us to better situate learners. You know, we can simulate, we can put them into more problem-based learning where they get lots of feedback, you know. So I don't know. I just, I don't know how, you know, I keep working on my elevator speech about what is adaptive learning. I I can't get it down to an elevator speech yet. Um, well, yeah, and I'm not sure, you know, and it's, I think where you stand, certainly that's important. I, you know, I don't know. I wonder sometimes if we need that, right, or if adaptive learning itself is not a fairly complex practice. Um, you know, I always think of adaptive, you know, it, it's on the one hand, it's, it's a principle, 
<laughs> of education. Um, it's a process whereby inputs to an educational experience are um, you know, put into a system or into a method and then learning in this is sort of been personalized. Um, and it's also a practice. Um, it's also something that, that teachers may choose to do with or without um, technology. Um, and then, you know, it's also a product in many respects. I, I've done some work before where, you know, we've sort of done some research around, you know, when people say adaptive learning, right, when we're even using this term even in this conversation, what do we mean by that? Um, are we talking about a product that somebody uses? Are we talking about a practice? Are we talking about a process? I think it's probably all of the above, right? And so I think that's what, you know, even to your comment, it makes the elevator pitch probably necessarily difficult to craft, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, when you're trying to, to find your champions on a campus, you know, yeah. you're trying to explain to them this is a very powerful tool, and yet at the same time it's going to totally change your work and the way in which you work. And yeah. they're very interested in wanting to know exactly what that means, you know? Yes. It's very yeah. scary on the one hand. So, yeah, so what would be your – your last little piece here, what would be your advice to people that are A, interested, um, let's say, let's look at this from two, two positions, from a, a strategic administrative viewpoint and yeah. that professor or group of professors that are interested, what do you think? How, what would you tell them when they say, well, how does one get started with this? What do we do? Yeah, well, I think um, you're asking a question that is what I live and breathe every day, thinking about this from both perspectives. Um, you know, from an administrator, from more of a strategic kind of enterprise-wide perspective, I think the issue is not so much whether you do adaptive learning. It's more whether your enterprise is set up organizationally in terms of your processes, your practices, whether you are actually ready for the adoption of these types of tools. I think this is a critical strategic question. Um, it's really a question around um, organizational readiness and enablers, uh, practices across the institution. Um, you know, is the institution itself, and I would probably think about this more within the framework of digital learning practices as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. How ready are you for the use of this technology? Um, and this gets down to everything from, you know, faculty awareness and, and buy-in to how you work with vendors, actually, and how do you manage contracts and how do you think about what tools and technologies you adopt uh, to your technological and IT infrastructure, to student demand, and the, the institute, the students and the markets that you're serving, the types of programs you offer. I mean, these are much more about enterprise-wide dynamics and, and enablers. And so, you know, and for us as a consulting firm, we do a lot of this work. We help institutions really think of this level. Um, and so I would say, you know, before you say, well, do we do adaptive learning? I would really want to ask, uh, can you do adaptive learning? And what are you going to need? What organizational inputs are you going to need in place um, to then appropriately and effectively use those tools. I think from a faculty perspective, um, you know, I think the question really becomes, this is a good question, it's one that comes up all the time. Um, I think there the issues are probably much more um, uh, idiosyncratic, <laughs> much more personal. It has a lot more to do with the individual and what their needs and objectives are. I would certainly say, and I think just for me, you know, having seen a lot of these tools, having done a lot of this research, um, you know, take the time and have an open mind because you might be pleasantly surprised um, what what this technology can actually do. Um, you know, look at the look at the outcomes. Um, you know, I think that um, while there still is yet to be a real kind of wholesale convincing, you know, efficacy research type of study, we've talked about this. Um, Nikki, I know this is work that you do, sort of thinking about this, but. Um, you know, engage with that. You might be really surprised even on kind of a micro level that there are some real gains in, in how students learn. Um, and I think that that's probably worth really thinking through. Um, but I would also, I hearken to, and I'm really, I, I, if you can't tell, I'm very, very, very um, excited about this, this contribution that we've been able to make to this report around this notion of adaptive teaching. Um, don't just think about this as a student-centered tool. Uh, if I may say, right? Think about this as a faculty center, as a, as a tool, as another tool in your toolbox, as an enabler to help you do what you do better. 
Um, you know, let the tool, let your own needs and expectations guide how you use the tool. And this gets to what we had talked about earlier. If you want something that's really customizable, um, that you can sort of pull content from different places and really track and put content in front of students at different times, that you can do that, right? If you want something that's more off the shelf, you can do that. Uh, think through all of those dynamics. Um, but I think the third thing, and this is just, again, having, you know, been a faculty member, having a lot of friends that are faculty members, you know, I often just generally recommend to engage the space. It's not going anywhere. Um, know it. Know it well. Um, you know, now are we moving towards, you know, wholesale, adaptive learning, enterprise-wide at every institution? Who knows? Probably not anytime soon. Um, but it's certainly not going anywhere. And this technology will only continue to get better and smarter, and it behooves anyone who's serious about teaching and learning to know it. Um, and to, to think critically about how it's used. Well, Brian, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I do want to say to our viewers that, if, particularly administrators, you know, Titan has done a fantastic job of giving you a great profile of some of the key vendors that are out there. And my personal experience advice would be to bring these vendors in, tell them what you want to do, let them talk about how they can meet uh, your needs and uh, ask for proof because some people say they can do things and we are finding out that that's not as much the case. So reach out to Titan Partners um, if you have um, additional needs and questions. I know they'll be happy to help you. And Brian, thanks again for your time. And we really do appreciate you taking the time to share the work that Titan has done around adaptive learning. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to be here. And certainly if anyone has questions or wants to continue the conversation, uh, please feel free to reach out. Great. Thanks a bunch.